Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. I'm Anand Swami Nathan. And I'm Jenny Beck Esme. So Jenny, what are we going to talk about today? Well, this week we had one of our fantastic pharmacists, a guy named Daniel Hayes. He came in and he gave a talk about the different medications that we can use for procedural sedation and analgesia. And uh, you did a talk on procedural sedation back in episode four, and you talked a little bit about some of the medication op- options, but you didn't really do a deep dive into the meds. So I thought we could talk a bit more about that. That's a great topic. You know, that was literally 100 podcasts ago. So it's probably time for us to talk about it again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Dr. Hayes started by reviewing the goals of procedural sedation as they were laid out by the Canadian Consensus Guidelines back in 1999. And now this is some pretty basic stuff, but I thought it'd be good for review. So they laid out basically kind of four principles that we need to think about with procedural sedation. The first is that the patient's safety always has to come first. That's a pretty clear cut one. Second, you want to think about the adequate analgesia, anxiolysis, sedation, and amnesia that you're going to need for painful therapeutic and diagnostic procedures. Third, the goal here is to minimize the adverse psychological responses that patients have due to the pain that they experience. And then last, we want to return the patient to a state in which it is safe to discharge them as soon as possible. Basically, if the patient needed to go to the OR and stay in the hospital, then they can just go to the OR and stay in the hospital. This is for stuff that we want to be able to do in the ER and then send them out. I think that's a good set of things to look at because it really is like a hierarchy. You know, patient safety has to come first, then everything else is going to be secondary to that, but it gives us a little bit of some rules of the road to go by. There's a lot of procedures that we sedate patients for, and I say that we do a procedural sedation at least once a shift. I did a couple yesterday, a couple on the shift the week before that. So I think this is pretty much something that we need to have extremely good control over. The common ones are things like fractures or dislocations that need reductions, cardioversion, burn debridement, and then there's a host, a bevy of pediatric procedures that come across our plate. When we're selecting medications, we want to think about the various elements of that procedural sedation that we want to cover. So we're going to be giving medications that meet the need of analgesia, so relief of pain, anxiolysis, the reduction of apprehension about what's coming, amnesia, loss of memory, which we don't always have when we do a procedural sedation, but just about every time we're trying to achieve that. And then, of course, sedation, so reduction of environmental awareness to various degrees. The first step is to decide which combination of these things you need to provide the patient in order to do the procedure that you're going to perform. So let's start talking about some of the medications. The first kind of big bucket of medications that we use are the benzodiazepines. So this includes medications like lorazepam, diazepam, and midazolam. At least in the U.S., those are our major ones. Now, the benzos are going to provide amnesia. So the patient's going to kind of forget things that happen after the time that they get their medication. Obviously, it's going to provide some anxiolysis, going to make them less nervous about what's going to happen. And then at the appropriate doses, it's also going to provide sedation, you know, put them to sleep to some degree. The most common ones we use in the ER, as I said, are the lorazepam, diazepam, and midazolam. And they all are going to have different durations of action, and it's going to depend on the routes of administration that you use them for. Now, there's a a really great table that one of our residents put together on the Coriam site, and we can put a link to that in the show notes that helps you kind of review all these different benzos. Of these, midazolam is going to be the fastest on and the fastest off. So it's often our go-to benzo for sedation in the emergency department. Here, the adult dosing is 2 to 5 milligrams IV. And when given IV, it goes to work within 1 to 3 minutes and lasts for about 30 to 80 minutes. The important thing to remember with all of the benzos is that they can be given IV. When given IV, they have a pretty quick onset of action. And of course, they also cause respiratory depression. So depending on the dose you give, you may get more or less respiratory depression. You have to take that into account. The next big category of meds that we're going to use are opiates. These provide analgesia, but no sedation or amnesia. Morphine and fentanyl are the most commonly used, and they have a number of places that also have things like remifentanil, which is ultra short acting. These can be given pre-procedurally for analgesia, or you can give them intra-procedure. I personally prefer to give them pre-procedure, and I don't need usually to give a lot more intra-procedure. Now, I like fentanyl here because of the short time of onset and the short-acting nature of it. But again, you do get some respiratory depression here, and you want to make sure when you are mixing opiates and a benzo that you are very careful about that mix because you can get pretty profound both respiratory depression as well as hypotension. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. 
One of my favorite points that Dr. Hayes made during this talk had to do with a, a myth surrounding opiates and nausea. And now, Swami, I know that you like medical myths. So were you taught that you should always provide an anti-emetic with your opiates because even a patient with no nausea is certainly going to kind of hurl their gut, guts out as soon as they get a little morphine? I've definitely been told that before. You should pre-treat the patient with a little bit of ondansetron or a little bit of metoclopramide and then give the opiate. Yeah, I was. I thought that too. Well, apparently, this is just really not borne out in the evidence. There, uh, he talked about a study with us that showed that patients given an opiate and an antiemetic versus an opiate and a placebo had no statistically significant difference in the amount of vomiting. So, Dr. Hayes urged us to just not routinely throw the antiemetic at the patient because it may kind of cloud some of your decision making on the patient's treatment and their dispo if you don't really actually know the degree of the nausea and vomiting that they have. It probably makes sense not to give it, but it does make sense also to have it on standby if nausea develops. True. The other great knowledge pearl that he dropped about antiemetics had to do with dosing. Now, this is a little side topic from our you know, procedural sedation and analgesia, but it was a great point. He said he routinely sees patients receive ondansetron 4 milligrams, followed by another 4 milligram dose because providers mistakenly think that 8 milligrams is actually going to be a better treatment dose. In fact, the evidence shows no difference between 4 milligrams and 8 milligrams with treatment of nausea. So his take home was that if the patient is still nauseated after four milligrams of ondansetron, another four milligrams is not going to do a darn thing. He thinks it's better to attack different receptors and provide a different antiemetic. This blew my mind. I agree. I see this all the time. I mean, every shift I see, oh, give him four. Didn't work. Let's give him another four. I do like to mix up the different antiemetics. I think that makes a lot more sense. So I guess this is another one of those routine practices that doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it. Now, we've covered a couple of med classes already, things like the opiates and the benzos, but there are some other favorite meds of mine that we should talk about. One of my favorites is Atomidate. Now, Atomidate's a great medication for RSI. We know it well, but it's great for procedural sedation as well. It provides good sedation and amnesia, but no analgesia. The onset is in about 30 to 45 seconds. It lasts for about five to eight minutes, and it's ideal for short procedures. This is my favorite drug to use for things like cardioversion. I don't tend to use it for orthopedic procedures, even if it's a short one, because you can get myoclonus as a side effect. The dose here is typically 0.1 mg per kg, but you can repeat that dose. Although, Jenny, I'll tell you, I've never had to repeat the dose. 0.1 mg per kg reliably sedates the patient. Yeah, agreed. The next big favorite for a lot of people is ketamine. Now, this is a dissociative anesthetic, so it provides both sedation and analgesia. That's great. It's used a lot in pediatrics. We see it in our PDR all the time. Now, the dose for this is going to differ by the route of administration. For IM, it's three to five mg per kg, and for IV, it's one to one and a half mg per kg. You can also use this medication at lower doses and just provide analgesia. And this is great and kind of an, an emerging use of this medication to avoid using opiates quite so much in the ER. The analgesia dose is 0.1 to 0.3 mg per kg. Some things that you're going to want to think about here. Now, the side effects can include an increase in airway secretion, so you need to be prepared for that. Patients may have an emergence reaction. That's where they have kind of this bad psychological reaction as the ketamine's wearing off. The idea here is that they may or they may not have that. And there's really no need to pre-treat with a benzodiazepine. If the emergence reaction happens, if the patient's really getting anxious or agitated, then you can treat with a traditional benzo if you need to. And then the last and probably most scary side effect that people think about with ketamine is the laryngospasm. Swami, have you ever seen this? So I've never seen the laryngospasm, but we talk a lot about it and how to combat it, which is probably the right thing to do. The more we talk about it, the less we'll have to see it. But when it does come, we'll be ready for it. The typical things that people talk about is you can BVM through it. That's one option. The other one that I have heard and talked about quite a bit is putting pressure on the laryngospasm notch, which is basically posterior to the mandible up near the ear. And pushing on this may help, or it may simply be that the ketamine wears off while you're doing that. Either way, it helps to reposition the airway, which may either open the vocal cord so that laryngospasm goes away, or it provides an, enough of an airway uh, change that there's enough air getting down that the patient doesn't have any desaturation. Saturations. If that laryngospasm is prolonged, a paralytic would be your friend here. So you can paralyze them, pass the tube, and then wait for everything to wear off and then extubate them. But I've never heard of that done. I've never heard anyone had to get to that point. The other things that we have to be wary with ketamine, if you push it too fast, it's more likely to result in apnea, especially in older patients. 
There's a great link that we dropped to Ruben Strayer's fantastic blog post on everything about ketamine with the dosing and the effects that you should definitely check out if this is an agent you're interested in. Now, finally, let's talk about propofol. This is a fast onset sedative that most people working in the emergency departments are probably pretty familiar with. Dosing here is 0.5 to 1 mg per kg, and it can be repeated as needed. So it's really good to start kind of low and increase boluses as needed. It's important to remember that this can't be used in a patient with an egg allergy, so make sure to check about patient's allergies before choosing your medication. And also be aware that you can see up to a 40% decrease in the blood pressure of the patient when you give this. So be prepared for that. Maybe not the best choice in a patient who's already got a soft blood pressure. Make sure you've got some good working lines and some IV fluids ready. Lastly, it provides no analgesia at all. This is just going to be a sedative for the patient. So be be sure to consider whether you need to treat their pain as well. And then also be aware that it can actually hurt as it infuses. That can be painful for the the patient in their arm as it's infusing. Especially you probably want to think about that in kids. One of the big tips that I've learned with propofol over the years, and this is with making the mistake and giving it or seeing other people make the mistake, is that in older patients, when you push that full dose, the 0.5 to 1 mg per kg, they are very likely to have hypotension and apnea. So the apnea is the one that I really, really, really want to avoid. And instead, what I do is I calculate my total dose. But then I titrate in 20 milligrams at a time until I get sedation. The key with that approach is remember that propofol has a very short half-life, so you don't want to wait a minute and then give your next dose. You're going to want to stack these doses every 15 to 20 seconds apart. The interesting thing is that you find some patients, they get 20 or 30 milligrams, and they are down. That's all they need in spite of whatever dose you calculated. They just need a little whiff of propofol, and they are out. Yeah, I love that when that happens. You're like, I've got this whole extra syringe. Now you're you're but you're out. It's done. <laughs> Um, the, the other thing that I, I mentioned briefly there was that the propofol can hurt as it's infusing in the, uh, in the IV. And so Dr. Hayes, the pharmacist, said that often he's asked by people if he can mix the propofol with lidocaine so that it's less painful as it's infusing. But his idea there is that all that really does is ultimately changes the concentration of the propofol in a way that can be dangerous and lead to dosing errors. So he doesn't recommend that. His thought on this uh, was, and it's shown actually a lot in the the anesthesia literature is that if you apply a tourniquet proximal to the IV and then about a minute or two before infusing the propofol, you can infuse either lidocaine, 0.5 mg per kg, or for adults, fentanyl, 100 to 150 micrograms. Leave that in there with the tourniquet on and then about a minute later, take the tourniquet off and give your propofol that that can help a lot with this pain as the propofol is going in. Additionally, and this kind of makes just intuitive sense, a larger IV is going to hurt less. So if at all possible, give this through an IV in the AC instead of in the hand. Yeah, that lidocaine trick is pretty good. You're basically doing like a beer block, right? You're putting up a pressure cuff so the lidocaine stays. It kind of is going to marinate in that part of the arm to create some anesthesia before you give your propofol. The other thing to remember, too, is that this uh, burn is only going to usually be for the first dose. So you give a couple of uh, milligrams of propofol, so you give that first 20 milligram bolus that's going to hurt, but then that pain is going to go away with the second dose. So it's not a huge problem, but especially, like you said, in pediatric patients, this can be very disconcerting to them. And then, of course, to their parents as well. So if you can avoid it, why not? So give a little bit of lidocaine. Sure. In the adults, it probably works to just kind of warn them that it's going to burn as it infuses the same way you do when you, you know, infiltrate lidocaine for something local. Hey, this is going to sting. It's going to go away. Everything's going to feel much better after that. But for the peds, you might want to just take away the pain completely. Absolutely. Now, we covered most of the main medications, but one that we didn't cover was a combination of two of our common meds, and that's ketamine and propofol or ketofol. The ketofol one-to-one combination is what we talk about quite a bit, so that's a one-to-one mix of ketamine and propofol in the same syringe. The theoretical advantage here is that you get all of the advantages of each of those drugs, but you get less of the side effects because you're using smaller doses. So for instance, propofol causes hypotension, ketamine doesn't, the two of those things kind of would cancel out. Ketamine can cause some nausea and emergence, propofol is going to suppress those reactions, so again, a nice combination. There's a fairly extensive repository of studies on this particular topic, and overall, they don't show any benefit of the one-to-one combination of ketamine and propofol. Now, all that being said, I know people who are huge fans of ketofol, but to a T, almost all of them say, you know, we don't do the one-to-one mix. I have a syringe of ketamine, I have a syringe of propofol, and I titrate the two of them in as I think the patient needs based on the clinical scenario. Now, I have played with ketofol before. I've played with one syringe of each. 
I don't find a huge advantage of that mix over just ketamine alone or propofol and fentanyl. So it's not something that I embrace, but it is something that if you're a resident, if you're a trainee, something to get some experience with. So find the person in your department who likes ketofol and use it and find out whether it works for you or not. Yeah, that's kind of great advice for residency in general. Try and learn how to do a little bit of everything so that when you go out on your own, you have the biggest possible toolbox. Absolutely. So, Swami, in lieu of our kind of standard take-home points that we do, I thought maybe I could ask you a few specific scenarios and see what your preferred agents would be. Sound okay? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so some kind of orthopedic reduction, like a really stubborn shoulder dislocation or one of those big hip dislocations. I would probably go with propofol and fentanyl or propofol and morphine. We used to use a lot of midazolam and fentanyl for this indication, but I'll tell you that combination of midazolam and fentanyl was a recipe for respiratory depression. It was absolutely 100% of those patients were going to get some respiratory depression, sometimes pretty severe. Ketamine would also be a pretty fine choice here too. Do you think that patients end up with a little bit more muscle relaxation with the propofol? I've heard the orthopedics guys think that before. As opposed to the ketamine, probably yeah. you do get a little bit more muscle relaxation, but I've done plenty of hips with propofol. I've done plenty of hips with midazolam fentanyl. I've done a couple with ketamine. I haven't had any issue with any of those. Great. Okay. How about cardioversion for like a rapid AFib? Well, I told you one mine on this one, and you know you've done this with me. Atominate and fentanyl is my go-to here. It's a short-acting combination of agents. It's a very reliable onset. It goes away fast. It is perfect for a short procedure. Great. And then how about like a pediatric lac repair? Let's make it complicated and put it on their face. Well, you said pediatric, so I'm going ketamine. Ketamine is right. always going to be my choice here. You know, the old approach was brutane. We would just put the patient in a papoose and we'd just be like, sit still. Hey, kid, sit still. Why aren't you sitting still, kid? And, you know, the more you <laughs> yell, the more they'll sit still. It's like pushing an elevator button. The more times you push it, the more likely that elevator will come. Ketamine is a great drug here. You can do it IM. There's no need to get an IV. I know some people do intranasal. That would be fine too. It's not something that I use routinely, but I love ketamine for this indication. Ketamine also a great drug for abscess drainages, whether that be in kids or adults. Excellent. Now, of course, remember patient safety always comes first. So whenever performing a sedation, be fully prepared to take the airway if needed. And when choosing your agents, think about which combinations of analgesia, anxiolysis, amnesia, and sedation that you should be providing. Well, that's all for the Core EM podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreem.net. We've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, follow us on Google Plus, and on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks, and see you all next week.